And we are live. Look at that. It's my uh, my second. Well, I would say it's my second time at Diana's show today. I've been hanging out over in the uh, the old mental health village. Yeah, isn't this your second talk of the day too, Douglas? I'm saying it again. Isn't this your second talk of the day as well? Basically, I've been talking for about six hours straight now. <laughs> Look at you go. <laughs> well, as I always say, if anybody ever needs me to speak, just ask. It's getting me to stop <laughs> talking. That nobody's been able to figure that out in 45 years. So, all right. Before I introduce Douglas's talk today, I want to give a shout out to the sponsors. Um, as well as our awesome audience here. Don't forget to check out the Career Village. Um, I, I heard they got some awesome resume reviewing and mock interviews going. Um, our awesome speaker today is Douglas Brush, who is a global advisory C uh, CISO at Splunk. And his talk is titled, You Don't Have to Be Crazy to Work Here, an honest talk about mental health. Um, with that, the stage is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, and I hope a couple of you had had a chance to check out the village today. So Mental Health Hackers, quick plug to them. Huge, huge thank you for Amanda Man Berlin, also known as Info Sister, and to Ray Redacted for everything that they do. I'm humbled and honored to be able to even just help them and even wear this T-shirt, even though I paid for it. And I recommend that you all get out and donate and get your T-shirt, too. Huge shout out to them and everything they're doing. And obviously a big, big gracious thank you to the Diana Initiative. Um, I, I can't even put into words how proud I am of what they do and how, quite frankly, humbled I am by what they're able to do. I organize a lot of conferences and being part of seeing them put this together the past two weeks has just been amazing. I mean, they're absolutely ninjas when it comes to this. So huge thanks to uh, Nicole and Jamie and really everybody else behind the scenes. For those of you just attending, I, I can't even express to you how hard it is to get this done. Um, and it's, 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 a, it's a feat of amazement. So thank you everybody for joining and thank you for Diana Initiative. Um, because I really want to start talking about things that I – have just recently been talking more about in our community and that's mental health and self-care cybersecurity professionals spend most of their day focused on the health and well-being of their environments in their care however this comes at the cost of reducing risk of our individuals i mean i'm sorry it comes at the cost and not reducing the risk of our individuals and our professionals mental health uh, a lot of people put a lot of things on the line and it's taxing and it really pushes people to the edge. So many information security professionals burn out, suffer from anxiety and depression and turn to unhealthy, unhealthy coping mechanisms um, like drugs and alcohol. And, and Danny and I were talking about that in the mental health village today. It's a very easy thing to fall into and, um, you know, get out of at times. Um, so this only further exacerbates when you do have poor health in, or maybe find the wrong, maybe poor is not the wrong, but use the wrong coping mechanisms to manage psychological and physical well-being. So my goal really with a lot of these talks now is to alleviate the stigma around mental health and really stress the importance about frank and open dialogues about this serious issue impacting our community. I really want to share my journey, uh, reverse engineer some of the stigma in ment around mental health and business, and look at ways that we can try to kind of hack back at mental health and be more productive and think about things in more meaningful ways. So as we go into this, I know it's been a long day for a lot of folks. Um, I just ask that you all just kind of focus on me, which I know is, you know, a little bit uh, narcissistic, but... Just try to listen to what I'm saying, at least put down the phones, mute the alerts, and really kind of let's focus and work on this together. So let's get started. And first I want to say I'm gonna there, there will be some trigger warnings in here, and there will be some uncomfortable subjects that I'm gonna talk about that can act as triggers. And triggers are those things that, to put it mildly, kind of haunt us and when discussed can make you feel like you're experiencing a past trauma. Sometimes you might not even know why this is happening. And I've, I've had this happen recently uh, on one of the Tim Ferriss podcasts. He was talking about early childhood, early childhood trauma. And it 
it, it just impacted me in a way I couldn't even describe. I became shaking. I, I got really upset. And I, it was just something about the subject matter he was talking about, uh, about abuse and other things that really impacted me. And I had this awful reaction. I had to turn it off and just kind of step away and go talk to my wife about it because of what the hell just happened. Um, and these things will happen and it's, it's natural. So if you do feel that way, if there's something I'm saying that you find upsetting and you can't get through by all means just step away there's no harm there's no foul in that do not feel like you need to tough through this if you start feeling bad so please turn off walk away recent recent or do not try to talk it out or tough it out i should say talk it out yes tough it out now and finally i'm not a doctor nor do i play one on tv i'm a global advisory CISO with a pink mohawk talking to you uh, on zoom or hopping so Set, level set on that. And this presentation's information is not intended or implied to substitute professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. So all the content, all the text, images, graphics, and information is for general information purposes only. I, my employer, the Diana Initiative, make no representation, assume no responsibility for the accuracy of this information contained or available through this presentation. This is not medical advice. So please speak to your physician before embarking on any treatment plan and never ever disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking medical treatment because of something you've heard or saw in this presentation. So I've got a little bit of a legal background, so that's my legal disclaimer, but please take this as information, but do seek help if you, if you feel you need it. And I do wanna talk a little bit about some of the definitions about what we hear out there. Um, and mental health, you know, when we talk about mental health, what is it? Health and Human Services describes mental health as our emotional, physical, physiological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, feel, and act. It also helps determine how we handle stress, relate to others, and make choices. And many factors contribute to mental health problems, including biological factors, um, such as genetics and brain chemistry, life experiences, such as trauma or abuse, and family history. Self-care is any activity that we do deliberately, it's something you really make an effort in order to control or take care of our mental, emotional, and physical health. These are not passive actions per se, but things that we do with intent that are self-initiated and self-controlled. And a topic that I wanna talk about, and again, I'm on the Neurodiversity Employee Resource Group at Splunk and co-chair of the community group, uh, community engagement group, and we've, look at ways that we can define what neurodiversity is. This is a rather new term we've all heard. And so I've kind of put together a definition from a variety of sources that neurodiversity is the idea that neurological differences like autism, ADHD, mood, and other functions, which have historically viewed with a negative perception, are in fact just the result of normal natural variations in the human genome. And so this represents a new and fundamentally different way of looking at conditions that were traditionally pathologized so it's a viewpoint that's not universally accepted at this point, but it's being increasingly supported by science. So neurodiversity advocates such as myself and others point out that neurodiverse people often have exceptional abilities alongside what society has lab labeled disabilities. But due to the time constraints, and there's you know really only so much time I can talk about all these subjects, we're gonna put that aside, but understand that that is a underlying theme about how mood disorder works, that it's not something that's broken, it's just part of who we are. So not gonna fire hose you with too much of that information about neurodiversity, but understand that there's a huge overlap. And I would encourage people to do some research on how to promote neurodiversity in your workplace. And by all means, reach out to me. Um, I started a, I guess, an international coalition of neurodiversity uh, employee resource leads. So we work with other companies, or I do, to help them build their programs. Do not hesitate to reach out to me for help and guidance. And for me, you know, my my goals going forward, I've been doing this a long time. This is even dated to say 26 plus years. It's probably closer to 30 years in IT, cybersecurity, information, um, governance, data privacy. Still obviously do a lot of work in that. And right now, I really have this kind of global role of helping programs and individuals and almost say it's like a, I'm like a CISO therapist where I go in and talk to them about their program and be a shoulder to cry on and a way to let them verbalize what they're going through. And then we can find constructive ways to build out their programs. Um, 
but it takes it takes a lot of effort in doing that. But really, it's to me, it's like I've been talking about technology and cybersecurity build downs for 30 years, and a lot of the problems are still the same. So I thought I would tackle the easy issues like diversity and inclusion and equity and mental health, because I think those are becoming easier issues in cybersecurity at times. So that's really become my focus um, on my talk tracks recently. Outside of work, I love snowboarding, cooking, making craft cocktails. Uh, the joke is I moved out to the Boulder area because zombies can't climb mountains. In my overly analytical, almost obsessive brains at time, I took out a map of the United States after so many different things that happened, which I'll talk a little bit about in New York, um, and said, okay, well, Boulder seems like a safe place to live. There's good schools. My job carried over here. Um why wouldn't I move here? And worse is the zombie apocalypse comes and get to higher ground. The zombies can't climb mountains. So that's a little bit of a joke. Um, but in all honesty, I've been doing incident response of some form for as long as I can remember. When the proverbial shit hits the fan, I'm usually the first person somebody calls. They look for me for guidance, support. I got this plaque in 1986 when a friend of mine, we were skiing at a local resort for... Um, you know, an after school thing. And he fell and hurt himself and was in terrible pain. We we're a weird part of the mountain. I went and got first aid. I got there back with them. I did all these things that were response and crisis management at a very young age. I was only, uh, you know, not even, I was only nine and a half at the time. So that's been part of my DNA. And it's been really who I look at as I build this persona at work of this idea of almost being the wolf from, you know, Winston Wolf from Pulp Fiction. People call me when they have a problem and I show up. I don't need a lot of context. I'm here to help you get rid of that dead body and make sure nobody gets, <laughs> nobody gets in trouble. But I really kind of go into these crisis situations with a cool as a cucumber persona. But I have really bad anxiety and that's odd for people to accept at times. Like, I don't understand that. Like you can literally walk into a burning building, um, but you have anxiety. How is that even possible? And it's weird. It's a hard thing for me to, to, to comprehend at times, too. And it's taken me a long time to come to terms with it. And I struggle with it because I, I, I don't understand it. Why can I solve some of the world's biggest cybersecurity problems? You know, I've been in global newspapers. I've been quoted all these things. I'm like, all right, it's cool. It doesn't bother me at all where people are like, that freaks me out. And I'm like, you know, about four years ago, I accidentally bumped my backpack into this girl on the New York City subway, and I'm sure she's still upset about it. And oh my God, I'm getting all worked up about it. I mean, these these free floating anxiety issues, these weird things come into my brain that debilitate me at times. And I obsessively worry about things. And they're small, meaningless things at times, but to me, they're the biggest things in the world. So yeah, I struggle with anxiety and it's led to depression and other types of issues that have hurt me professionally and personally. So it's the monster in the closet I have to deal with. It's the yin to my yang. So while my superpower is to be even Steven, just cool as a cucumber, underlying that, there's a lot I'm, I'm managing on any day-to-day -day basis, which I'll talk about. And I look at it wider, you know, really in our, our security community. I mean, that's a lot of people I talk to are dealing with this idea that, hey, I can't deal with my own stress. I I have to maintain this damn near perfection in what I do in my day-to-day -day life. And Andrea Lombago said it in an interview a few years ago. She says, like, there's never downtime. It's nonstop and every day is a battle. And it's like in cybersecurity, we need to be right seemingly like all the fucking time and attackers get to get it right once or maybe a few times and explode a series of vulnerabilities. So it's no wonder that depression, burnout, and even suicide are becoming more prevalent among cybersecurity professionals. Depression is still the leading cause of disability in the world, according to the World Health Organization after heart disease. So that's, that's pretty big, but we don't talk about it enough. And people with mental health conditions have the highest risk uh, group for suicide. There was a nominate study in 2019, and this was just for CISOs, but draws a good example for a lot of us in our careers, is that it was a global study of, 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 of cybersecurity professionals, again, focused on CISOs. 91% of the CISOs surveyed said they had levels of stress that were suffering that were moderate to high. 
60% rarely disconnected from their work role. 88% of the CISOs work more than 40 hours per week and 27% that work up to 60 hours. 89% of US-based CISOs never having a two-week break from their job. So most of them feel that they're unappreciated by senior leadership. Almost all felt like a breach was inevitable. However, when asked in their same organization, when they asked the CEOs, only 60% of the CEOs felt that a breach was inevitable. But a third felt they would lose their job or be written up formally if there was a breach or a major incident. So there's no surprise that in the leadership community for CISOs, there's a high turnover. Many don't stay in their jobs for long. And so when I think about like where we are as, again, solving the same problems for 30 years and where we are programmatically, you know, in, in working with these CISOs, it's no wonder that we continue to have these problems and that we haven't solved a lot of the, the issues because it really takes a CISO, a good CISO, 18 months to two years to really start affecting change in their job. So let's think about this. You know, we have this slow ramp up over a year or say. Things go well for about three to six months. Then they burn out. Then a new CISO comes in with the same mismanagement and misalignment, or misalignment with leadership and management, go through an 18-month cycle and they leave. And it becomes this vicious cycle. And it really starts to me to think, well, then we really need a top-down approach of managing stress, anxiety, depression, mood disorders from the top down. You know, we talk about everything in information security is top down from technical and tactical. Why not with the people? It needs to start with leadership and thinking about the way that leaders are able to cope and maintain within these environments. So, you know, mental health conditions come in many forms, but the stress that folks have right now gets exas will exacerbate a lot of these underlying conditions and can accelerate early onset and acuity of a lot of conditions. So stress management becomes this huge root cause for episodic symptoms and these underlying diseases really kind of rearing their ugly head. And like I said before, it's causing folks to really not know where to go. And what are some of our go-to coping mechanisms? And we're coming up on Vegas in a couple of weeks and we know the problems. It's alcohol, it's drugs, it's strip clubs. It's the party scene to blow off steam in the summer. But that's not for everybody. So that further alienates people in our community. You know, Jamie Tomasello, speaking at Black Hat in 2018, talked about the stigma she faced being a recovering alcoholic in a culture that pushes us far too hard. And quite frankly, as a community, we've done a piss poor job of helping each other here. And look, I'm not going out for having drinks. I'm drinking actually Red Bull right now, which is probably worse in many regards. We're having beer or tap on the office, but it can't be our only answer to coping with this. And this is why I encourage things like mental health hackers in the villages of why we're doing something in DEF CON this year. I have become, as a leader in the, the Splunk ERG for neurodiversity, I'm putting down our money and we're renting a room. I just signed the contract at Paris. I'm not Paris. I went, I'm sorry, Planet Hollywood to have a chill out room so people can go and decompress without alcohol, without the scene, without all the noise, places where they can reset and let their neurochemicals go back to where they should be. So we need to find more answers to coping with this. Because I'll admit, I've done a really bad job up until recently. Um, it, you know, it's all my staff and clients know it. I'm the first one to say, fuck it, let's just go, let's go have fun. But there's got to be a better way to do it. Because it's almost like saying, well, screw it. You know, the only way to ma manage the risk is we'll just throw AB at it and good to go. And we walk away. And there's no one silver bullet to deal with attackers or our health. So we know this is not true in our computer networks, but we seem to avoid a multifaceted layer approach to maintain health in our neural networks. So we need to change this. And it's getting worse right now because with Corona, it's been a hard year. You know, work, school, loss of routines and schedules. That has an incredible amount of stress on people. People have lost loved ones. People have lost jobs. People have just gone through a, a lot of trauma. And, you know, up until recently, I mean, I've only started traveling again. And for 30 years, I've been on the road. Um, and I miss seeing all of you. I miss being in the room with people, doing the Doug show on stage in front of clients and customers. I feel completely off my game. I'm not looking for pity, but to say that, you know, if you're feeling this way, you're not alone. Everybody's lives have been upended. 
and multiple times a day, I'm talking to friends and family that are really struggling coming out of COVID. Um, I think we're going to have a real strong issue of PTSD of this because people don't want to have look back and cope. They just want to jump into the next thing. So, you know, right now I, I feel like I would do anything for those I love and those close to me, but I, I feel kind of powerless right now because we're still limited in what we can do. And I can't just sweep in like Winston Wolf and just fix everything. And there was one article I read recently that still talked about Corona and everything that's going on and, Obviously, there's a new Delta variant, but it's this, this unrelenting horizonless of this COVID world. So this, this idea of just, it's, it's more than just depression. It's more than just, you know, burnout. It's this fatigue of this never ending cycle of trauma. So we need to start looking at new ways of how we can approach this. Because if we don't, the end game is can be really worse. The long tail effects of this are devastating. Suicide rates have been on the rise throughout the last year. And even my home state of Colorado, it's grim. It's this toxic stress that are pushing people over the edge. And people feel hopeless. And I relate to that. I, I get it. I don't talk further about how where I felt like that. So we need to think of things in more constructive ways to support each other and really acknowledge that feeling of hopelessness. And, you know, one of the things that I, I think about when I think about hopelessness, there's, there's a band I really love, H2O from New York, you know, New York hardcore scene, but it's like helpless, not hopeless. There's always hope. You got to keep that PMA and you need to find ways to address these issues because we have to talk about this. You know, mental health cannot be avoided as a topic in cybersecurity any longer. So my pledge to this community is to raise awareness and remove this stigma. I do not have all the answers and I won't pretend to, but I will not be shy anymore to talk about this issue because we're hackers. We can figure out a better path forward together. You know, Corona aside, which is the obvious elephant in the room, it's only exacerbated the underlying issues. We still need to do root cause analysis on the profession itself. And I start thinking, well, how did we get here? And, you know, information security really is an industry that's relatively new. It's this Frankenstein monster that's been brought to life by IT, consulting, operations, legal, compliance, privacy. Quite frankly, we have a bit of an identity crisis as we've entered our teenage years. And with that, I felt like we've adopted a lot of good business practices, but also a lot of negative. There's so much pressure to work harder, work longer, tough it out, just have this aggression, aggression, aggression. There's times I do well in it. I'm a type A personality but it comes at a cost. And this type of mental construct of just driving hard doesn't work for everybody. I've seen it change generationally. And the staff I've hired over the past five or 10 years have straight up said, I want a better work-life balance. Money, titles, glory, they're less and less important. So we need to address this as an industry because we don't have good answers to these needs. We can't tell people, we'll throw more money at you if you work longer. That's not the answer. So I have some ideas and I can actually show how it has worked financially. They still need to be adapted and peer reviewed and tested, but I want to work on this with all of you together um, because I think it's something we need to, we need to figure out. You know, we just can't burn the candle at both ends anymore in this industry. We're, we have 400,000 job wrecks allegedly. If we're burning people out, that's not sustainable. So another thing I want to talk on or another factor before I touch on my journey is, um, you know, lives can be on the line with cyber if you're in certain industries. And when I was in pure IT, I can always blame a bad patch for a down server. But a breach, that's not a technical problem. That means a human had an interaction at a certain point that a breach happened. And that's heavy stuff we don't prepare people for. And again, we don't have, we have this idea we have to be right all the time or else. And we need to be easier on each other in on this industry because it's not fair, it's not healthy, it's not scalable. Because most of the time, lives are not on the line. It's a business that maybe didn't fund the right controls or CISO that didn't articulate it to the, the business of what the risk management is. But we got to stop taking it out on the analysts in the proverbial intern when bad shit happens. So right now, I'm going to jump into my journey. And again, just again, it's a little heads up of a trigger warning here. So if you want to step back, um, by all means. I was born in 1976, New York City, and I was one of only 
children, although I have three half sisters, all very type A, hard driving personalities. My youngest sister is the Broadway tour manager for Hamilton. Please do not hit me up for tickets. I can't even get, she can't even get them. Um, and just, I've been surrounded with these type A, just hard driving personalities. You know, even as a teenager, I felt I had to leave my mark on the world, that there would have to be this, this thing I do. But I didn't feel comfortable in high school. I was beat up, bullied, alienated. I was a skater punk. You know, that didn't fit well in upstate New York. Well, upstate-ish New York. I was in the Hudson Valley region. But that didn't really align with that proverbial jock mentality of, you know, it was, it was almost like living in the Heather school. Um, and it, I just didn't fit in. I didn't think the same. I didn't look the same. I didn't approach problems. Hell, teachers and, and the administrators were like, you are bright, but we don't even know what to do. Just just don't get in trouble because I would find creative, funny things to do that they didn't appreciate either. But I really started having these, these feelings I couldn't really identify with. And I was hanging out with my friends and somebody had some weed, which was you know kind of crazy back in the, the, the 90s. And I smoked some weed and had this massive, massive panic attack, crippling. It went on for days and I, I thought I was going to die. I mean, I, I went, finally told my parents what had happened. They kind of laughed it off a little bit being you know, parents from the seventies brought me to the hospital. Doctor, like, what's wrong with you? Your heart rate's up, but overall you're fine. Like all your blood works fine. Go home. Can't, can't eat, can't sleep. Massive insomnia, ongoing, ongoing panic attacks. Go back to the hospital, back and forth. Finally, a doctor said, Hey, you're having a panic attack. This is anxiety. I'm like, what the hell is that? He's like, well, you have, um, a reaction to something. There's something that's going on in your, your, your brain chemicals, but you're having a fight or flight response. And I'm like, well, what the hell is that? And so really, if you look about just a quick medical side note, so if you the difference between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, the sympathetic nervous system prepares the body for the fight or flight response during a potential danger. On the other hand, the parasympathetic nervous system inhibits the body from overworking and restoring a body to a calm and composed state. The sympathetic and parasympathetic system for me um, can be triggered and broken in, in various ways, even though, like I said, it can be in a... Weird stressful conditions doesn't affect it. Other things, maybe chemical stimulants, maybe I, I don't know all of them. <laughs> you know, can can have things. I'll talk about a couple, but it can throw me off. And so I didn't know this, and I felt, oh God, I'm broken. Like I'm that's it. Life's over. Like I'm I'm you know 17, 16, 17 years old. Like I'm a broken human being. I was like, no, I could get some therapy and put me on Paxil, and things got better. And I got out of that. And coming out of high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Again, I didn't fit into the world. They were like, go to go to college. You like computers. I'm like, I'm not learning mainframes. I'm 1993, 94. Like, I don't know. Like, I already can build networks and rebuild computers. Like, what, what are they going to teach me? Like, I should be in there teaching about, you know, network operating systems. And they're like, no, no, well, we don't do that. So I'm like, all right. So I started my own business. I started my own business in 1995, right, right in the first month got really successful. My parents being the people who they are really were supporting me, allowed me to take uh, some of the college investments I had, start a business. And I was off to the races with a company called Computer House Calls, basically doing your break fix type things for computers um, in the 90s, setting up networks. And I was growing and I got some really good business clients that brought me into other enterprise business clients. All of a sudden, Within four years, I'm serving Merrill Lynch in New York City, and I'm building out huge networks. And I burned out, just kept going. I was traveling. I was not taking care of myself. I kept going, and I had another bout of anxiety. And I completely just had a nervous breakdown and was burnt out and couldn't work for weeks. I had to cancel a lot of projects. I hurt my business. I, I just didn't know what to do. And again, I went back to the doctor and they're like, like, you need to fix me. Like, well, you're, you have a condition. It's not that you're, you're framing it a little bit wrong. Got on the medication again. Things got better. And things really went well for, for a long time. Um, 2006, uh, it was 15 years ago in a couple of weeks in July of 19, um, of 2000, July 3rd of uh, 2006, I met my wife and things went well. I'm still, my business is now running pretty calm. I'm taking time for myself. I'm, I'm taking care of myself. But as this grows up and, or as I grew up through that process and, and started to mature and have a wife and then 
a, you know, a family, I have a baby. I was really struggling around 2012 with who I am and what I'm doing and having to leave behind some of the entrepreneurial stuff and go in house at a company. And I just, I wasn't right. I was in the right kind of mental framing, let's say for that and struggling. I say, how do I be, you know, working for somebody now? I've always been the out. I'm a hacker. I don't work for people, man. And I was the outcast. I, I, not having to work for somebody to have health care for a kid and all this. And it was, it was just really, I was really struggling and not doing well with this up until about 2015 and 16 and started another practice. So I kind of went more into an entrepreneurial role, but was not communicating well. I was very isolated. Uh, I was depressed all the time, focused too heavily on work. And it was hurting my relationship with my wife and even my new kid. And it was just, I was despondent. I probably should have gotten more help than I, I did at the time. I got some therapy and counseling, but wasn't really serious or committed to it and really felt that what I had to do was get out of that environment. So what my wife and I started looking at it again, we had a series of wonky things that happened in New York city that were noticeably stressful, like having to move twice because of hurricanes, you know, there was hurricane Sandy had displaced us for several weeks, like seven weeks. And we just got tired of that in the New York City life. And we're like, okay, well, where do we go? Let's go to New York City. Let's go to Boulder and look at it. Look at this map of Boulder. Did all my risk analysis. I knew at that time there was going to be a, a potential. Um, <laughs> I even said, I don't know if I use the word avian, but I said there was going to be a respiratory type infection that was going to come from um, Chinese origins because of things that had happened with SARS. I had mapped out. I've been doing a lot of business continuity and pandemic planning at the time. I was like, something's going to hit a major city. Let's get the hell out of here. So we're getting ready to leave. Um, and we are packing up. We're getting everything out of the apartment. We're coming to Boulder, start a new life. I'm going to leave the, be the, the crap behind me because there's just too much stress and things I haven't processed in my past. So I'll just, I'll just go somewhere new. That will solve everything. Until somebody on her phone uh, ran a red light texting and hit my side of the car two weeks before we are about to move. We were actually out driving around to go find a breakfast place in Brooklyn because they were showing the apartment and wanted us out there uh, for renting. And get out of the car, everybody screaming, crying, we know what's going on. Luckily, everybody was nobody was was we were able to see who th that they were hurt. But the next day I couldn't move. I had Turned out I had blown out two uh, discs in my back pretty bad. I had severe neurological pain um, and impedance in my foot. It was called drop foot because the nerves were so badly compressed in my back. I was just, in, in, it was nonstop pain and numbness and where it just felt awful. So here I'm trying to move to a new city um, or a new town and I, I'm in an immense pain. Um, can't help my family move. And that's just taking its toll on me. I get out here. Okay, I'm going to get some help. And I get some really great physical therapy help. I mean, Boulder's great. I was getting help from people that help star athletes and Olympians. So it's great. I told the job where I was with at the time, you know, look, I want to go out, start a new life out there, but I'm going to still maintain this business. And I've always had a kind of rocky relationship with them, but it was something I think when I was out of sight and out of mind, they repivoted the way they wanted this business. And about two weeks out after here, use everything we could to get out here. Cars destroyed, backs hurt. They eliminated me and my entire division on the spot. I was out of work, I was out of healthcare insurance. Um, their reaction was, look, this is just a financial decision. What's the problem? I'm like, look, I, I have medical bills now that I need this insurance. Like car insurance is covering some of this, but there's other things. And look, I got a family, man. Like you can't just do this and like, no, this is, this is just business. And to them, it was this cold hearted thing. And I had people that were working for me. You know, I had, I, I was a practice leader of a group and four sales people, bunch of analysts, everybody's out of a job and looking at me like, what do I do? So the people in my care are struggling. So I'm feeling horrible and I'm like, screw it. I'm just going to go. I'm not going to deal with this trauma. I'm just going to dig in. So I start helping with B-Sides Denver, reach out to some of the, the groups out here in Colorado, start working with them. But I'm not really taking care of myself. And then re-hurting my back, actually getting ready for B-Sides Denver, uh, which it's only I'm on the board of still. Um, and the pain just gets really bad. And at that point, I just collapse. I, I can't move on. Um it was, it was too much. And really, I think the, the physical pain, the mental pain, everything caught up. 
in May of uh, 2017, and I became just despondent. Couldn't get out of bed, um, and things got things got dark, and it just continued to get worse. And one of the ways that you can start rating some of these things, so you have the American Institute of Stress has this Holmes Run Stress Inventory Scale. So most people like, you know, or you want to stay around 150 or lower. So you add up all these things that happen on that left-hand column. It's too small to read. You can look it up. But it's things like death in the family, new job, moving, birth of a kid, like all these things. And good or bad stress in your in your body is going to build up over time, and particularly over short periods of time. 300 points or more is like really bad. Like you're, you don't want to be that. When I added up everything, I was over 400. I mean, I was literally off the chart in the levels of stress. I mean, I only highlighted a couple. We only have so much time. But so much happened in such a short period of time of starting a new life with injury that the depression just started setting in. And emotional pain starts manifesting its ways in physical pain. Like, there's no other way. It's really hard to describe. But, you know, once you start getting in these kind of mild areas to moderate, you know, you really need to start getting help and seeking help and doing things. But to me, it was like I was going to tough it out. I actually still trying to get help, but I was, it was really hard. Part of our American system of health is if you don't have job, you don't have insurance. So I couldn't get insurance help. And at that point, you know, we we had to get government assistance just for things like food and stuff. Um which again, just takes its stress. I mean, I went from this incredibly high paying job, being able to pay for my family to not, not being able to get my own medical insurance. And it's just compounding and building on itself to the point where, you know, the severe scale, you know, when you're in that seven, you're avoiding things. It just got worse. It got to a 10, if not more. Um, you literally can't think it's going to get any worse. And you don't, you want it to stop. And you start thinking pretty dark thoughts. You think suicidal. And for those that have never been in that hole, you know, it's one thing to have uh, bad days and, and really struggle. But when it goes on and there's emotional trauma for a long time, it starts to eat at you. And there's a there's a passage by William Styron that really describes it better than anything I've ever found. And he wrote this memoir on depression in 1990 called darkness visible and there's one quote i never never read from slides hell i never put this much word on slides but i think this is profound to look at and hear at the same time because it it gives you a glimpse into what that dark closet is like and it's the great drizzle of horror induced by depression takes on the equal it takes on the quality of physical pain but it's not an immediately identifiable pain like that of a broken limb it may be more accurate to say that despair, owing to some evil trick played upon the sick brain by the inhibiting psyche, comes to resemble the diabolical discomfort of being imprisoned in a fiercely overheated room. And because no breeze stirs this cauldron, because there's no escape from the smothering confinement, it is entirely natural that the victim begins to think ceaselessly of oblivion or oblivion. You want it to end when it's that part, when all these things just crush you. Um, it's horrible. But God willing, <laughs> I'm an atheist, but God willing, I found help. I finally got the therapy and the help I needed. I was able to get the medication I needed. I was able to get out of that hole. Uh, love and support a family that took its toll on them to this day. I mean, it was. it's not a good spot to be in. And really it was, and I can say it now, and say it sounds weird to say it, but only three or four months. But those are the longest fucking three months of my life. And at times I didn't want to live. But I got out of it. I found a job and I built a practice here in Denver that reframed the way I thought about work. So I took a lot of lessons learned about it because, you know, it was never easy, but it was worth it. Um, for my family, for, for those I eventually got to employ, for more importantly, for me, and I needed to, I needed, I deserved it. And I needed to understand, I need to accept that I deserved to live and I deserved to love myself and I deserve to be loved and to continue. And I'm fucking glad I did. And I have an amazing life now. I get to do all the things I love to do, but it took 
it took a lot to get out of that hole and it took reaching out and asking for help. Um, and look, it's not, it hasn't been easy. I've last year there's been Corona. I've gotten a new job, but it's been incredibly stressful. And I sometimes don't know when to say no to things. Um, you know, when I was going to speak here on mental health, I said, I'll help out in the mental health village because hell I'm doing it on site at Wild West Hockey Fest, DEF CON. I'll help at a Diana initiative. And that would have been fine had I not agreed to speak at four of the conferences, had I not agreed to teach a class at Harvard while taking it, had I not um, agreed to take on another federal appointment, had I agreed, and I just, I put too much on my plate lately and I'm pretty much near the walls of burnout right now. And so this weekend I'm really gonna take some time to unplug, but it's a constant battle. I mean, I, I just know it's always there. And I've come to accept that this is who I am and I love myself for it. I'm okay with it. I'm not perfect. I don't need to be fixed, but I need to know that mental illness is an illness. And I got to move past the stigma and the shame that people feel about their illnesses and differences. Because quite frankly, it, it promotes people not to seek professional treatment, forces people to self-medicate. So we got to remove the stigma because, you know, if somebody had, was diabetic, you wouldn't tell them to suck it up and just smile. You wouldn't call them names like, hey, insulin baby, like we call people who are crazy. So we need to stop treating each other that way. And I bet many people have experiences where they just didn't feel mentally healthy for that day. And then ended up using a physical ailment as an excuse to take a sick day and not going to work. It's bullshit. We need to go past that. And people say, well, you know, why don't you just being altruistic, you know, capitalism, you know, we need to keep going. Again, what if I told you that in my post-traumatic journey, when I started building a business and looking at things in a resilient fashion, just like I would look at building a cybersecurity program for resilience, not perfection, I looked at how I could build a practice and a business that had resilience. And I started thinking about the mental well-being of my staff. And you know what? It resulted in people who were happier and therefore better at their jobs, which results in higher employee satisfaction, higher retention rates, higher customer satisfaction as well. It ended up with more top line revenue and greater profit margins when I had happier, healthier employees. Because when people feel their best, they perform at their best, full stop. So this bullshit about mental health versus business is a joke. There's no zero sum game. Everyone can and should win. And you know, what are some of the, just the basics that people can do right now in, in their workplace and, and raising or alleviating some of the stigma? First, talk openly about mental health. It's not easy for me to do this. Like I'm, I, this takes its toll out of me every time, but it's worth it. Because ultimately I wanna educate you and others. So you need to get out there and educate others about this as well. Do be conscious of your language. Like I said, I mean, we, we use, hey, this must be crazy. And there's a lot of trigger words that we use in our environments that hurt people emotionally, that have emotional trauma, just as we are being more aware of things that we say that could hurt people that have um, other underrepresented or that come from underrepresented groups that are now learning to adopt and change our language. It's part of natural linguistic evolution is to change and adapt. So it's not that hard to stop saying things that could be triggering or upsetting to people. Because I really want to, you know, fourthly, encourage equality between physical and mental illness. I want it to be this parody where people are not like, ooh, you know, mental illness is, uh, but, you know, physical, like, oh, we would go to the doctor for that. No, there needs to be that open dialogue. So if somebody is not feeling well mentally, they go out and they seek the help. Ultimately, I want you all to show compassion for those with mental illness because this is not an easy journey. So please be there for people. And I ask, I know a, a lot of what people try to do is comforting at times by saying, oh, don't worry, Doug. I know I've been there too. I had a really bad day. Please don't be dismissive like that. Um, unless you were identified with that, or you've really been in there, don't identify with, just listen, listen to us who have suffered this stuff, just as you would listen to somebody else in their experience and life journeys and maybe another group, you wouldn't say, well, I know what it's like to be black as a white guy. No, I don't. So please don't tell me you know how it is to go through what I have through unless you've been there. And if you have, it's okay. And we'll get out of it. But do allow that open dialogue for others because I really want to have empowerment over shame. I don't want people to feel bad about these conditions. Understand that, again, these are just differences. 
and we can celebrate them and be better because of them. And when you do need help, be honest about the treatment. You know, it's, it's something that you need and it's okay. It's okay to ask for it because it's, it's, it's something that um, a lot of people need, but don't seek. And I'm trying to encourage more people just to be honest about getting it and then pushing it in the workplace, you know, whether it's a mental health day or whatever it is, just getting people out. And that's more of a self-care thing, but you know, these ideas that we need to, to need time off to deal with this and do call other people's out. You know, you know, I said this in my, my diversity talk about hiring is that, you know, call people out when they're being stigmatizing about things. Silence equals compliance. And I know there's going to be those folks that's there say, oh, everyone's so sensitive these days. And it's like, no, people have always been aware of what an asshole you are. We're just finally letting you know. So do not be afraid to call people out when they're using language that hurts others. I mean, it's not okay. And just because that's the way it was doesn't mean it's the way that should, things should be. And ultimately, please do not harbor self-stigma. It's okay not to feel okay. I have some resources, sir, that I can dig into de deeper into each one of these areas. But the one thing that my therapist said to me, and I'll share a little bit how I got out of my, my thing and just quickly brief into to what I did to get out of these, these kind of darker areas. He said to me, I'm going to advance slide, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. It's a little bit flippant, and I've been criticized for using this slide before. But I think it's important to understand that, you know, you, 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 you have to get out of that hole, that the pain that you there is, just, it's going to happen. You're going to have pain and trauma in your life. You just have to make a conscious choice at times to find ways out of it. So some of the things that I've done um, are a, a variety of different things. So it's been medication. Um, that's worked. I finally had to go through several different iterations of things that I found worked and keep me in a, a balance. Um, you know, it's just Lexapro. It's nothing crazy. But I found it helped. It was the minimal effective dose which helped too. Another thing is cognitive therapy. So acceptance and commitment therapy has been extremely valuable to me and for my personality and my neurotype for it. What acceptance and commitment therapy is or ACT is this action-oriented approach to psychotherapy that stems from traditional behavior therapy and cognitive behavior therapy. So Individuals in treatment learn to stop avoiding and denying and struggling with their inner emotions. And instead, what we do is we accept that these are deeper feelings are appropriate responses to certain situations that should not prevent me from moving forward in my life. So with this understanding, you know, people in this modality of treatment begin to accept that issues and hardships are there and you just make committed necessary changes in your behavior, regardless of what's going on in your life. And choosing how you want to feel about it. You know, you, again, you're going to have these reactions. It's very much centered in being in the moment, saying, this sucks right now. I'm okay with it because I can't solve every problem. And some of the things that I had to do is almost existentially to help me get in those mindsets of being in the moment is reducing some of the external st stress um, because we're all facing with it. And I, you have to set these boundaries, the, these, these ways of not letting people kind of eat off your plate or your time. So some of the things I've done is reducing alert fatigue. I don't have, and I haven't had for years, I don't have work email on my phone. I don't have work Slack. I don't know what I have on my phone. I probably have Brave Browser and Google Maps. I mean, I, I use it for very little, but I, I've removed all the alerts, all the things that are specifically designed to make you respond in a certain way. I got rid of all that. Um, and I make sure I have very good schedules that when I work on something, I work on something. No more multitasking, focus periods of deep work. Um, I've used things like the Pomodoro technique to get motivated when I've had to get over just like small things to get myself motivated working on a specific task, but I only work on that task at that time. And a lot of this just comes down to routines. Like for example, I set morning routines. Now before I touch any tech or do anything, I'll do some meditation, some journaling, just kind of ease into the day. Because it's it's important to really set that mindset for me personally as I enter the day and have this routine. I get up at 5 a.m. I go through this every day or most days I can. I, again, I don't strive for perfection, but I find it helps me kind of level set for the day. As much as I can, I make sure I'm hydrated as well enough. I'm sleeping right. I'm getting exercise where I can. Um, and I take breaks from things like drinking. I am starting a cocktail um, bitters company. 
And I know that that can lead to a lot of danger of me excessively drinking. So I have to take conscious breaks and, and, and not drink for periods of time. It's just healthy, I'm not against it. You know, it's just, I need to balance. And that's what this all comes down to is finding that balance in my life. Um, because overall, I just want to be more accepting of who I am and being focused more on the moment. And this is who I am and this is who I, I'm going to be. And I don't have to fix everything. And I really want to share the moments I'm with, with the people I'm with at that moment. So it's a real strong focus on me. And it leads into a little bit of this idea of self-care. And again, the self-care is this idea of what you do deliberately for yourself to establish and maintain mental health or really any health. And the idea is to prevent and be ahead of long-term illness. So it's kind of early down in the kill chain. And we joked earlier today in the mental health village that now I've, again, I'm going to overextend myself and come up with a um, self-care early prevention kill chain for stress. So preventing burnout with kill chains. It's an, another thing I need to put on my plate. But if you think about self-care is, is this, it's a proactive and preventative steps, just like you would do at work for vulnerability research, threat hunting, patching firewalls. It's the stuff you kind of do for yourself. Um, because what you want to do is start balancing out some of these brain chemicals. And the two main ones being serotonin and dopamine. And serotonin does a variety of things in the body. It regulates anxiety, happiness, mood. Low levels have been attributed to depression and anxiety. So they think, or at least which most of the research has shown. They still don't know a lot about it. And dopamine is the feel-good transmitter. It's the one that the brain releases when we eat food that we crave or when we have sex, contributing to feelings of pleasure and satisfaction. It's part of that whole reward system. It's an important uh, neurochemical which boosts mood, motivation, and attention and helps regulate movement, learning, and emotional response. And it's very easy to overdo it, overstimulate yourself, and your brain stops having that cycle where the healthy parts of that work. And some of the things you can do for self-care is, again, they're simple, small little things that can have a bigger impact. One of the things I think is really important is celebrate the small wins. Um, if you had a good day, celebrate it. You know, it doesn't have to be crazy. You don't have to go balls out to the wall, but maybe have a nice dinner and just go do something celebratory for yourself. When you're down, don't be afraid to call a friend and ask for help. You know, that's, that's the one thing I think that more people can do is just pick up a phone and, you know, or just slack somebody at work. You know, if somebody you're close would say, I just need to vent or get something off my, my plate. Those little bursts of just dumping things and steadily letting them fester can be incredibly important. Um, certainly exercising. Danny and I were talking about to say, don't, you don't have to go crazy. Just simple. Start small. Maybe it's a, I'm going to walk five minutes today. And then I'm going to walk five minutes twice a week. And then maybe I'll do 15 minutes twice a week. Whatever. Just start small and build up because it's gonna help you get to where you wanna go goal-wise. One of the things too is obviously when we talk about Corona and everything that's happened over the last year is stop doom scrolling, like get off social media. Um, as good as things like Twitter can be for our community, I've seen it go extremely toxic and y'all know what I'm talking about. Um, and it has an emotional response. So get away from that stuff as much as you can and stop reading the news obsessively, um, particularly with the last year, it's just been stressful. And there's a lot of things you can't change with that. Be aware. Don't be consumed. Again, I talked about these routines, like getting into these routines of sleep, exercise, meditation. They can be incredibly helpful. And the one thing I stress with all of this is that done is better than perfect. Like you don't have to every day have these. And I did that and I did it wrong for a long care time for self-care. It's just, oh, it has to be this rigid thing that doesn't. You know, you want to just have these, these slow kind of builds of things. And if you do it 80% of the time, that's great. Um, because that's going to be really important because you can really fuck it up too. You can also do fake self-care. And I've seen this as, like I said, it's a drive for me. It's like I overdo it. And it's, you know, it's, I've done just about all these antics on the list of fake self-care, you know, most notably dieting, drinking, harmfully talking down to myself to motivate myself, just a bunch of BS or, Oh, I'm going to miss out on something, this FOMO thing. So instead of saying time with my family, being in the moment, like I talked about rushing out and being away from things. So it's very easy to fool yourself and do things that are unhealthy in the name of health, but you deserve it. You know, there's these myths about self-care and I really want to get rid of that stigma that is selfish or, you know, it's like this big ask in your life. It's not. You deserve it. Again, when you feel better, you'll treat others better. And just getting these little routines of doing it. You know, there's this idea that, you know, you do something for 21 days, you get into good habits. So try it for 21 days. Just try good, healthy things that I put on that slide. 
of little routines that you can add on for 21 days. You'll find that you'll build some momentum and you'll start feeling better, I guarantee it. But it needs to be an ongoing practice. So please, that's the one thing I encourage you is, is starting with some self-care because you, des you deserve it. You know, we love you. We think you, you need it. You need it. Love yourself and start there. And I just want to leave you all with some parting thoughts. You know, it, it's again, this is obviously some heavier subjects and we've gotten some deeper stuff, but I really love this quote from Robin Williams um, because ultimately the one thing that I try to learn from in my past, mis I don't want to even use the words mistakes. That's not right. My journey is not only to be more aware of how I am to myself, but how I am to others. So first, you know, obviously forgive yourself, be kind to yourself, be vulnerable. And we spend so much time addressing vulnerabilities in our networks, but how much are we time looking at the vulnerabilities that we feel in ourselves and we improve our cyber programs, do the same with yourself, accept them, focus on what you can improve in your own well-being, and be resilient. Um, but be nice to others um, because honestly, you can't control other people in most situations. You can really only choose how you respond, how you choose to respond to other people. Warren Buffett was uh, giving this TV interview one time and he says, uh, it was this gentleman by the name of Thomas Murphy. And I'm a so I'm sorry. So the best piece of advice that Warren Buffett got was in an interview. He was talking about this by his friend, Thomas Murphy. And Thomas Murphy said to him, Warren, you can always tell someone to go to hell tomorrow. Meaning that it was kind of this easy way of putting it. You don't have this missed opportunity to tell somebody to go fuck off. Just forget about it for a day. If you feel the same way tomorrow, tell them, but don't spout things off in the moment of anger. Like, again, we call a lot of what we do incident response, not incident reaction. Don't react to everything. Slow your roll. We do not have to react to everything in our environment because, like I said, in most situations, you can only control how you react. So respond, be in the moment. But as my friend Dalton said at the Double Deuce, be nice. Don't let everything get under your skin. It's a simple little reframing of things, of how you choose to respond to life stresses that's going to start you on this journey. Because... Really, you need to make time for your wellness, or I guarantee you'll be forced to make time for your illness. I encourage everybody to do one little takeaway task. Tonight, before you go to bed, put down by your bed, I'm sure everybody's got a pad or something they can write on. And when you wake up tomorrow, write down five good things about yourself. First thing when you wake up, Maybe do your meditation or before you touch any tech, you know, as part of your morning routine, write down five good things about yourself. And I bet that's going to be a lot harder than you think. And it's a tough thing. And the reason I want people to do that is to really sit and focus and think about the good things that you bring to the table and to the world because you do. But you need to consciously do that because we all get into this negative habits of putting ourselves down and saying we didn't do enough. But start your day right by maybe just writing down a couple good things about yourself. You'll be surprised how that reframes a lot of what you do because you're worth it. You know, we love you. We need you. Community needs you. So support each other. Hack the planet. I'm open for Q&A. Douglas, I think I speak for the audience here when I say your talk was immensely enjoyable and we all learned so much. Um, I don't think I've seen any question here and we've got about two minutes left. So if anyone in the audience have um, questions, please send them in now. So I don't think um, there's any questions from the audience. Um, uh, thank you so much. This is such an important conversation to have. Thank so you, have a good rest of your day. Thanks, everybody.